Right, I think we're ready to get going again. Um, I hope everyone's in the room that needs to be in the room now. Um, it's great to see so many people again say that. It's great to see so many people here on our final day. And I know that we'll have many more people watching online. So as you probably realize, this is our 25th anniversary. Um, and that has provided us with the opportunity to do things slightly differently at this conference. And I hope you'll agree that I think it's, it's gone off really well. I've really, really enjoyed the conference so far. And a lot of that has been down to all of you. So thank you for that. So as we've said throughout the conference, um, Martin, myself, and the other trustees have been far more involved in the organization of the conference this year. And there's been a bit more focus on ALT itself, and we felt that was very appropriate because it was our 25th anniversary. And over the past couple of years, there's been quite a few changes to ALT as an organization. We've changed our charitable status. Um, we've developed and launched a new strategy. And if you were at the AGM yesterday, you will have seen that we've um, passed a resolution to update our governance structures to keep us in line with other charitable organizations that are similar to us, and also in terms of our responsibility and the guidance laid down by the Charities Commission. And I think these um, changes, and the other big change I should have mentioned there as well, is we've become a, a fully virtual organization as well over the past year. And all of these changes are providing a really firm foundation for the association to move forward and grow for the next 25 years. And I think it's fair to say that as a board of trustees, we've been very active in, in all of these developments, but they have really been driven by an, our CEO, Marin Deepwell. And when we were thinking of keynotes for the conference, both Martin and I were almost in, in, in one mind about this, that we both thought it would be a great opportunity for Marin to speak at the conference. Um, Marin, as you know, has been our CEO for six years, but this is actually her 10th year working at ALT. So it's a bit of a, an anniversary year for Marin as well. And I think what this conference has shown is that ALT really is greater than the sum of its parts. And community is really important to me, as I think that came, that came through from all, from all of you as well and on the Q&A that we did earlier there. And certainly as part of my tenure as, as chair of the association, I um, really want to support the community because I feel Im immensely proud and privileged to be your representatives and to chair our organization. Um, but Marin represents, and in many ways, is the voice of our community on many, many stages. And to that, we are all very grateful. As you can have seen from this morning, I'm not very good at being Marin at times. <laughs> um, but you know, we're grateful for the work that Mar um, Marin does. She's a wonderful ambassador and advocate for the association um, and the work of our community. But Marin is also uniquely placed now um, to give her own insights into the role of learning technology and leadership. I mean, Marin plays, is a fantastic leader as well. And her own voice is becoming increasingly visible through her blog. Uh, many of you might have seen the article that she published for Wonk HE on Tuesday. If you haven't, I urge you to go and, and, go and read it. Um, so on our 25th anniversary, it gives me great pleasure to invite Marin on the stage, not to organize me or anybody else, but to share her words of wisdom with you about and advocacy on learning technology. So please give a warm welcome for today's keynote, Marin Deepwell. Well, I'm really excited. And I have to say that Amber and Tressie have set the bar pretty high. I'm really grateful to my team and the trustees to make it possible for me to take a step back from organizing this event and for being the face of ALT. I sometimes feel like I'm a building or a piece of paper when I walk into a room because most people say, hello, are you ALT? And I'm like, um, yes. <laughs> First day in the job, that was a bit of a shock. But um, I don't think I'm going to take a leaf out of giving you a marketing talk, or I've not brought any breakdowns of our pricing structure. I've also not brought any solutions. Instead, I thought I'm going to take the opportunity to share with you 
who I am and what insight I gain working at the heart of what you do. So I wanted to introduce myself by showing you um, a very tattered old laptop that I used to do most of my work on and that I love dearly and that from all of the contributions from member organizations over the last few years has become more and more colorful. Um, the Captain Picard badge is my own addition because I'm a Star Trek fan at heart and when I was little Captain Picard and the Enterprise was my blueprint for what it was like to be a leader. I'm pleased to say that since then I've met many wonderful, inspiring individuals and many of them are here in the room today who've diversified my role models of what it means to lead in learning technology. And I hope that in turn I help to inspire some more diversity in our leadership. But I have a very privileged position and I think that's one of the things I'm gonna come back to speaking about later. Now, standing in my shoes is a very unique perspective, as Sheila mentioned. I get to work with everyone from ministers and policymakers in the UK and also internationally to individuals who use a gadget for the first time who might be struggling with PowerPoint, you know, underneath desks trying frantically to plug things in, and all of the members from across sectors in the UK and internationally really inform my perspective and inform my work and my practice as a learning technology, a learning technologist. I can't cover all of that in less than an hour, but I do hope that I can give you some insight in what it means to stand in my shoes. I'm not from within one of organization. I don't work in one college or in one university, although I have done my part of lecturing and being at the front of classrooms and supporting staff in the past. But I do have the privilege to journey all across our membership and meet many of you in person. And so all the photographs in my presentation today are taken from work trips that I've done over the last year. Because as I'm an, trained as an artist and an anthropologist as well, I thought I'd show you in material and visual terms exactly what my perspective is made of. But the title of my talk and the theme for today is Beyond Advocacy. And I'm particularly interested in looking at the horizon and what's on, on the horizon. I'm going to start by quoting Audrey Waters, his keynote a few years with us um, ago, has really inspired me and also informs my thinking. And Audrey's work, in particular her work analyzing the recent Horizon report has, um, has, I think, been really interesting. And Audrey is looking at the Horizon reports each year when they get published and look what's on the prediction curve. So look at what's ahead. And then actually check back and see, has that come true? How many times have we predicted the same things coming up again and again on the horizon? And so Audrey wrote that after doing her analysis, which she's published as well, and I urge you to read, she writes that our takeaway, now and then and always, do not worry about what this report says is on the horizon. I bet you in five, 10, 20 years time, folks will still be predicting that it's almost here. Nothing in EdTech ever dies. It just gets renamed, rebranded as innovative and stays in circulation forever. It's zombie EdTech, always on the horizon. And given that I did my PhD in cemeteries and I'm fully versed in all burial culture sundries, I think zombie ed tech is right up my street. And I'm incredibly frustrated at times with this narrative about what's always on the horizon and how that's going to solve all the problems that we have. And that's one of the questions that I hope to get to explore with you today. Because ed tech does keep promising us and I think being locked into a sort of perpetual cycle of not arriving, of just advocacy for tech that does not deliver to its full potential, it's never really quite there where we think it could go. That's, I think, causing us some issues. And we can go back through the history of learning technology and come across countless solutions of solving problems. And I think some of the sessions at this conference who have been looking back into the history of learning technology, some from a more personal or feminist perspective, 
others more from a straight historical critical perspective, have helped really highlight that. There's always promises of cutting costs or reteaching teacher workloads to improve learning outcomes or to increase student satisfaction. But this outlook on a global scale, I think places the UK on a national level in a policy context that I heard a Finnish education expert, Pasi Saalberg, at OEB last year describe as follows. He had this wonderful diagram, and in my um, notes, you'll see links to that. Um, Pasi um, shared some of the wisdom of why Finland is, is top of all the, the education league table, and he says there's two types of education policy making, and the type that he feels we have in the UK is characterized as market-led privatization, text-based accountability, deprofessionalization, standardization, and competition, resulting, in his view, in unsuccessful policy making. And I think, for me, there is part of our reliance on what the future might hold and the potential that might bring is partly responsible for our policy making, not maybe taking a challenge now. Now, Advocating for what's just beyond the horizon, I think, brings three problems with it. And on this slide, which is from my visit to um, Lunch Old Northern Ireland earlier this year, um, I've highlighted three that I feel are particularly key. First, it gives us the sense that technological innovation is the driver behind change, the only solution to solving issues that we face. I think the dominant narrative, the way I see it, is that we are at the mercy, we're not empowered of, we're at the mercy of inevitable innovation, of the march of the machine. So the robot that's marching towards taking your role, or the data that's going to control the rest of your life. And that we need to keep running in order to keep pace. And this in turn highlights the second problem that a perspective informed by advocacy focuses only on what's ahead and increases our perception to compete harder with each other, both as individuals and between different institutions. We're always running to keep up. And the third issue that I've identified and that I think comes out again and again is that this perspective of continual advocacy for technology to solve our problems tends to ignore history, the research and the evidence that we now have. And we do have 25 years and more of research that ALD and other bodies have collated and individuals like yourselves have contributed to. So I think one of the questions I want us to think about is whether being focused on advocating what's always just on the horizon what's always just beyond our ability to make happen now, whether we're using that to absolve us from some of the ethical responsibility we have to really actively solve some of the issues now. And also, from not being focused on some of the problems that we have right now and some of the real challenges I think we're facing here in the UK, but also as educators, as part of a global community. So I do promise there are some more cheerful parts of this talk as well, but the beginning of it, I saw a little bit more critical. Now, I thought I'd make it three out of three for Martin Weller to be quoted in keynotes, so I think he does definitely owe us a book, particularly as he is not here now. But like you all, I've been following his blog posts on the 25 years of EdTech, and I found them really inspiring. I'm not going to be able to follow Amber's example and chart my timeline in learning technology against his blog posts because I'm a little bit behind the curve 25 years ago and haven't discovered EdTech at that point. But um, I have followed his blog posts with great interest. So one of the um, quotes that I've drawn out is around how important criticality is to the role of learning technology and society at large. At large. And Martin says that there's an increasing number of voices that articulate how things are changing, who are shifting the discourse to more critical ground. And he emphasizes our need to take a critical approach in our thinking to examine the commercial interests that influence its development. For example, while learning analytics have gained a good deal of positive coverage regarding their ability to aid learners 
and educators. Others have questioned their role in learner agency and monitoring and ethics. And I think that's just one example Martin's drawn out of where it's useful and constructive for us to take a more critical approach. I want to, I think, emphasize that this isn't critical against technology, but it is to be critical towards our use of it and our relationship to it and reflect on it more. Because I don't think anyone here would deny the huge potential of technology going forward, but also how much it's changed our lives all throughout human history, and particularly with digital technology in more recent times. So thinking about the voices that shape our discourse and maybe whom we're not hearing so much, I wanted to draw on the work of Catherine Cronin, who's been a huge inspiration to me and um, who's helped find some really helpful references for my talk um, in the run-up to this. And Catherine and Francis ran a great session at the start of this conference around personal feminist perspectives on the history of learning technology. And alongside them, practitioners and professors like Maha Bali, or Bon Stewart and Claire Thompson and Helen Beetham and Laura Chernovich all inspired me alongside keynotes like Tressy and Amber here in thinking more about what we maybe don't read about, maybe the voices that we still need to be drawing out more. And Catherine wrote in her blog post before the conference that long-standing work in critical and feminist pedagogy, for example, is not often cited in later work about MOOCs, online open teaching pedagogy. Acknowledgement and analysis of earlier work is vital in the importance in, in important in education. So I think I want to acknowledge and I want to use this platform and this privilege of having a, a keynote to talk to you today to also acknowledge some of the voices that are maybe more marginalized and that we aren't um, listening to enough, that we don't hear enough. So my vision, my hope, what I work for is to move us and to contribute to moving us to a more empowered and critical practice that enables us to negotiate and articulate our relationship with technology and how we use it for learning and teaching. Because with the ever-growing challenges facing us and decades of research and practice to inform our thinking, it seems clear that EdTech won't save us. And I think some of you might have the t-shirt to prove that. Um, it won't save us, and it shouldn't be the driving force, in my mind, behind what we do. Instead, I think we have to move beyond advocacy for tech that is the answer to all our problems, and towards a more empowered and critical perspective. This isn't to say, as I mentioned earlier, and I want to emphasize this point, that technology doesn't have a significant potential, and I don't mean to dismiss in any way the role of industry that plays in the work we do, or how much technology can bring benefits for learners and in education in generally. But I feel strongly that it needs to be an empowered relationship instead of us being threatened to be buried under an avalanche. So my questions are, how do we move beyond advocacy? How do we realize our potential and the potential of our professional practice for the benefit of learners and for the greater good? World peace, I think, was one of the wishes that um, one of the delegates shared via Twitter for the future, so um, I'm going with that. And how do we move to using learning technology to meet some of the biggest challenges we're facing globally? And I'd like to explore those questions
and leadership are a really good reflection of how our professional practice is embracing bigger questions and a more diverse kind of practice. Iteration, which is to be tech support for all my family and friends. So I'm pretty sure <laughs> some of you have had phone calls and like, my email doesn't work, or how do you connect the TV to you know, the newfangled something that's arrived? I failed explaining to my father how Wi-Fi works. We're still not sure what the cloud might be in my household. But also, I think particularly for anyone who works in the civil service, I would have suggested learning technology for Ministers 101, a recurring course every time someone new comes in. And, and then inspired by Lorna's um, sensational tweet of her wonderful keynote shoes, um, Lorna, respect to you for those wonderful shoe tweets, um, to increase impact. I think that was the most widely tweeted tweet that ever came out of any of our events. So um, I'm expecting to see many examples of creatively translating our practice into portfolios soon. But also, I wanted to highlight that management and leadership, one of the areas that we've looked at throughout this conference a bit more, has really increased and by really increased, I mean, you need to see this in perspective. There's a few hundred people in the scheme really increase. It's like in the single figures. So I, um, I don't want to give you the impression that there's um, a large amount of people as yet. But we do see more and more learning technology professionals choosing management or leadership specialisms as they move into new and more senior roles. Because their expertise in learning technology becomes more important as technology becomes more complex and our demands of what can be achieved for students and staff on a large scale become more ambitious. And I think very exemplary leaders that we have in the community, such as Melissa Hyten, who is sitting here with us, are great examples leading the way in what leadership in learning technology looks like in practice. And many of you have taken part in the consultation to make a new pathway for CMOLD 
um, to enhance the professional recognition that Sheila mentioned earlier. And we've also been, or I've also been, having a little peek at what that looks like. What does senior CMOLD professionalization look like? And I wanted to share with you just a brief glimpse of some of the specialist areas that are coming out from those individuals who are starting to pilot that scheme itself. And I'm not sure if it's quite big enough for you to read, but it includes scholarship of learning, um, of technology enhanced learning and open access publishing, assessment, online courses and mobile learning, and also staff development, training and leadership. And similar to the earlier chart, where we had a look at when first specialisms appeared in our timeline, I think these choices reflect how our more senior roles in learning technology are developing their focus. Now, one of the big differentiators between this senior pathway and the existing framework is that you have to demonstrate an advanced area of practice, and it's very similar to the specialisms that we're familiar with, but you are specifically asked to relate it to the core principles of CMOLD. And I wanted to include this slide in my deck because I think it's really interesting when our members came together to try and articulate what the core principles were, which have not changed for over 10 years. Um, it actually took a lot of discussion to come to a consensus of what these core principles are and how we interpret them. So following the maxim that visual thinkery can probably express it a little bit more succinctly than we could with words, here are the core principles as articulated by members and captured by Brian Mothers. And that's hopefully going to help make our core principles more easily understood for our profession. And I think to me, they reflect professional practice beyond advocacy. They are very much a reflection of a more critical, a more reflective approach to professional practice. And so, these new advanced um, areas of practice, which you have to relate to these core areas, there's only a handful of those, because the pilot's been quite small, um, that we know of thus far. But I wanted to share with you the topics that participants have chosen from the pilot group. And they include research in postgraduate distance learning or blended professional development, to leadership of CPD programs, and leadership in the development of research and practice communities. And I wanted to mention um, the work of Tom Cochran here, who is one of um, an outstanding, um, a long-standing member of ALT, who is based in New Zealand, who is not with us today. But I think he's demonstrated in his portfolio what a research approach to professional, um, professional accreditation with CMALT is. And um, I wanted to acknowledge that because very few individuals are as research intensive as Tom and have gone through this accreditation. So I think his portfolio is a real area of inspiration for us as we make the most of our research and practice. So while at the moment it is still quite a limited insight that we are gauging, it does give us a glimpse of what the kind of empowered critical approaches to professional practice in learning technology may develop into, and hopefully that will grow as a pathway. Now, given that this is keynote for me, I thought I want to also contribute a bit of my own perspective on how I tried to go down the senior CMOLD pathway. And I think when I gained CMOLD two years ago, I thought it was really rewarding, but I was also really relieved. Having advocated for a scheme for years, I put it to the test and found it to be a valuable and rewarding experience. And in retrospect, I felt all the more honest and frank about all the advocating that I've been doing on behalf of the scheme in the years before. And so when I started thinking about my senior CMOLD submission, I decided that I wanted to choose promoting equality in learning technology as my advanced area of practice because that's one of the causes that I'm really passionate about and that I feel we have a long way to go in. And as soon as I'd done that and I looked at providing evidence and description of what I'd done, I realized that my fantasy CMOL specialism might easily turn into a nightmare. And so before I go and share a little bit more about this with you, I just wanted to unpack this part of my work and why I think it's really important and why I specifically chose it to feature it. And I mentioned at the very start that I feel I have a, a real position of relative privilege. 
but I nonetheless experience inequality all the time and every day. And in the space in which we work, learning technology sits at the intersection of the tech industry, of education, politics, and the third sector. And when I started working in this space, I had no concept of how much inequality I was going to encounter and how much more inequality other people were going to be faced with. And you can tell already that I found it quite hard to write about this dispassionately. And I had a very friendly, critical friend and editor who helped me try and edit this into something that is other than just a complete rant and becomes more of a sort of dispassionate statement of professional practice. And one of the inspirations that Catherine reminded me of was Laura Chernovich, really inspiring keynote here three years ago, where Lorna, uh, Laura stood on this stage herself and talked to us about inequalities in higher education. And she made us reflect on the structural nature of inequality, thinking about it on a national and on a global scale, and not just in the global north or in the west, but all across the world, and thinking really about the bigger picture. Because it's very important for us to look at the examples of inequality from a global perspective, but not to be blind to what's closer to home, because there's still a long way to go. And I think any person working through the strikes and through the disputes over recent years will see that there is a lot where we can still fight for. And I also feel really passionately about the fact that equality is for everyone. It isn't a women's thing. This isn't for some of us. This involves all of us. And I gave a talk at ILTA a few years ago, which was all about that. It was a five-minute gaster, which was just about the fact that equality was everyone's responsibility. So I thought the need to promote equality would end my practice response to that would be a great example of practice to include in my portfolio. And I specifically chose it because I think it's important for us to highlight that this is an area of learning technology that we're not going to really find on job descriptions, that is not usually going to turn up in a sort of record of achievements or at annual appraisals. And I'm very fortunate that I'm in a position where I can hopefully demonstrate, it hasn't been assessed yet, so it might all turn into nothing, but I'm hoping to have demonstrated that this is a an, an legitimate and integral part of professional practice as a learning technologist. And at this point, I wanted to show you two examples of the initiatives that I've supported and included as evidence in my portfolio. So I'd like to give a big wave to every Fem Ed Tech participant in the room. Um, and I know there's quite a few of you out there. And I think initiatives like FemEdTech really help us create more diverse, a more inclusive perspective and community. And this isn't an effort that's only relevant to those involved, but hopefully one that will reach out. Because many initiatives come and go, and there isn't enough, in my view, joined up thinking. And we've done some joined up thinking with Uncommon Women as well, grassroots project that we've been supporting. And Maybe we can also see some familiar faces I've watercolored in. But projects like Uncommon Women demonstrate that one of the key ways in which we can achieve a greater critical perspective is through more collaboration, more knowledge exchange, and openness. Our practice is political, but it's personal. And active participation in any of these initiatives does make a difference. And if I've learned anything from the individuals who lead these initiatives, who've inspired me to be active and to participate and to give my time and my effort and my voice to these causes, is that it does make a difference. It helps us articulate a narrative that isn't dominated by tech advocacy alone and expands our personal learning networks beyond those we already know and feel comfortable with, help us burst those filter bubbles that surround us. So this is my favorite slide. Ooh, no. Oh, I'm missing my favorite slide. Great. I clearly have deleted that. Sorry about that. 
I was going to show you a picture. I'm just going to talk through it. I'm going to, I was going to show you a picture of a box that I got through the mail a few months ago from my mentor, Margaret, who I've known for six years. And I had a big day coming up at work that I was nervous about. And it was a little blue and white striped box made up in a sort of Superman style, um, sort of superhero style. And on the cover it said, empowerment pants, super undies for the hero in you. And um, I was so thrilled to receive that. It's from a charity project in Scotland that supports women and girls. And you buy the pants and it's a charitable donation, but you also get a pair of pants that say empowerment pants on them. And um, you can wear them on special days. <laughs> and um, I'm not wearing them today, just in case you're wondering. But um, I thought it was a wonderful gesture because the, the person in us that needs some encouragement, that needs some empowerment, you know, might get that in any way possible. And I thought, it brought a humorous and charming and very personal way of sending me some encouragement through the mail. So the point I did want to make telling you about empowerment pants is that criticality and collaboration are at the heart of our professional practice and that it enables us to work in partnership with industry to inform how the products and services that we use are developed and to influence policy that effectively governs our relationship with technology and the tech industry. We do have the power, we do have a voice to shape what the future will look like. And then the last part of my talk, I wanted to share with you a little bit about what I think others have said to that. But I also wanted to highlight, just before I go and do that, one more example of practice that I haven't really mentioned, which is around the collaboration aspect and that I also used in my portfolio. And as well as the Fem EdTech project I mentioned, I wanted to mention a collaboration to make a policy paper for policy makers and give them a call to action for openness in education. I wanted to give an example as collaboration working with startups which I did this year um, with some of the community where we worked on a guide on how technologists and startups can work together. And one project that's close to my heart is on open leadership because when I became a CEO and I looked around for examples of how CEOs do their business and how they get work done, I couldn't really find a lot of open leadership. All I could find is, you know, really polished marketing written blog posts about charity fundraising or success. And I found that really off-putting. And I thought, where are the reflective blogs of people in my position? And, um, and so I thought, we must start a senior staff and lead the way. So Martin and Hoxie and I, for the last six months, have been blogging on the go about our efforts to lead a new virtual team with the consent of all of our colleagues, which we are grateful for. And we share our very much our work in progress with that. So all these sparks of openness and all the sparks of collaboration that networks like the Uncommon Women Network and FEMED Tech and collaborations such as these and all the events such as this as well bring together, I hope will spark some openness and bring us towards being more critical together. Ah, oh, there are the pants you see. Um, <laughs> so you get my favorite slide after all. Right. So now to close, I wanted to share with you what the future might look like, and I particularly wanted to not do that in my own voice. Because while I do have a strong vision for the future, and when I first came to the ALT conference in this venue in 2009, <laughs> certainly things look different, and now much of that has come true. It is really your voices and your action that is going to shape what we do next, where we go in learning technology, not just as a sector, but as professionals, as individuals, as people. And so Martin Hawks and I were invited to give and to host the LTHE chat. So a shout out to all of you who participate in that. I am a frequent lurker, sometimes participant, and I absolutely love this Wednesday evening Twitter chat. And we asked, as a topic, we gave developing critical and open approaches to learning technology. And at the very end of the talk, we had a question for all the participants. And the question was to share a hope 
their hope for the future of learning technology. And I hope you can read these tweets yourself, but I also want to emphasize some of what they say. Because their vision for the future of learning technology is to be inclusive, not a bolt-on, not an alternative lesser experience. That all education is open. That we will scrutinize the result, no, sorry. That we will have greater scrutiny of results and greater understanding of the process followed to produce the results. And they also highlighted the need to raise the lowest level of engagement with technology and pedagogy, as well as supporting those at the cutting edge. And I think this conference is a great example of bringing all of those different perspectives together. But I think my favorite hope of that evening that really struck a chord with me was from Simon Lancaster. And he wrote that he hopes for a symbiotic and ultimately synergetic relationship with pedagogy to be established, which facilitates a revolution in society's objectives for our education system. So in case you were wondering what you were going to be doing in the future, I hope you take Simon's hope to heart. And as you can see from this wonderful, messy graph of our conversation that you can explore yourself on, online with Tags Explorer, we have had so much responses to this conversation that I felt it was only fitting to bring my keynote on Beyond Advocacy to a close by asking you to share your vision and by inviting you to share your hope. Because I hope to do an even better job next year round advocating for you and representing you and contributing to the work of the association. But I want you to hopefully also have a voice in this keynote and in this vision going forward. Now, I mentioned that 10 years ago I came and started working for ALT in 2009 in Manchester. This was my first conference. I have to say I was thoroughly intimidated after three days. I think I went home and I thought, never again. And never did I think that only nine years later I would stand on the stage and have the privilege of talking to you and sharing some of my thoughts and my vision. So now it's over to you. And before we go and have questions, I'm hoping that you will be able to share your hopes and we'll leave them up on screen. So what is your hope for the future of learning technology? And just to close, a final thought from me. And thanks for all the badges that I received as part of my travels recently. I just wanted to encourage you all to use your platforms and use your voice and use that inspiring approach that Amber talked to us yesterday, that if you are invited to the meeting and you have a voice, that you can lean in, that you can make your voices heard. Not everyone has the privilege to stand up here, but we all have a voice that makes a difference. And so, inspired by Martin Weller and um, my early morning running, where I like to listen to quite a lot of public enemy, I'm going to leave you with that quote and say thank you very much. I think that was a wonderful keynote to finish um, our, or to get our third day started. I'm sure there are many questions from the audience um, and there'll be many questions coming through online. But is there anyone here in the room that would like to ask Marin a question first? Come on, it's the last day. Somebody take the mic. Come on. No? Well, they're all hung over. They're all hung over. Okay. Well, we've got lots of questions coming through. So um, I'm going to let Marin maybe have the prerogative of choosing one of the questions that she would like to, to answer. Hmm. There was a lot in that, that keynote, so. I think it's an interesting point about diversity. Um, I think some of us discussed this yesterday, what the relationship is between collaboration and diversity and bringing in different voices to the work that we do as professionals. I think it's really important, particularly at conferences like this, that we're seeing increasing participation from students, we're seeing increasing participation from people who might have not been part of this conversation 10 years ago. It's a really important survival strategy for us to reach out and to engage more people. All of you have got the challenge of implementing and working learning technology at scale. 
we're far beyond the, just the pilot study, just one room, just the enthusiasts. For, for learning technology, I feel to, to reach its real potential, for us to make happen what we think is possible, we do need to be more diverse, be more inclusive. So I feel that's a really strong point to be making. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's nice to read your hopes as well. Um, yeah. um, should we read any out at all? Yeah. Well, I think this is, I, I, my hope is that we can engage with academics on a level, play, level playing field without having to declare our credentials first or just be seen as the people who do the tech stuff. And I think there's many people who feel like that. But I think there's one thing that's come through for me over the past three days is, um, I suppose, a confirmation of that need for balance and for mutual respect. And I'm really pleased that we are looking at things more critically, but there is a balance to be struck in terms of what we're all ultimately trying to do, which is to support staff and learners um, and engage you know, the educational process. So it's quite a, a fine balancing line. But yes, I don't think any of us should have to justify anything that we do, that there should be mutual respect for everyone in, in the profession. And again, I just want to say, I told you all eight, uh, earlier on that none of you are imposters, so I don't want any more of this imposter syndrome talk, okay? Um, it's my last day as the boss, so I'm making the most of it. Um, I think we're all quite enjoying you being our boss. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, obviously, more cake is great. Um, yeah. Well, well, this is a good question. Will learning tech become its own academic field in time? Oh, that's an interesting question. That's quite a tricky question, actually, because whatever I say, half of you are going to disagree entirely. Um, so I suppose one perspective is to say learning technology as a professional discipline has existed for a long time, and the fact that we celebrate our 25th birthday is testament to that. There is other organizations like us all across the world, although we don't all use the same terms to describe what we do. Indeed, I think not even within this one country, we have less than 10 terms to describe learning technologists, um, even just a core role. One of, the, one of the strengths I feel with learning technology is that we do borrow and work with other academic disciplines. We, we get a lot from social sciences, but also from education and computer science. Learning technology is very much part of the fabric of all learning and teaching. I'm not sure if I feel that it should be its own, necessarily its own academic discipline, because I feel it's very overarching, it's very embracing, and the research that I've seen published comes from a lot of different backgrounds and disciplines. But it's right what Amber said yesterday, that there is huge differences between the disciplines. So I think working across the different disciplines in order to gain different perspectives um, is one of the, the key importance. So, absolutely, and I think again, as the um, you know alt develops, we have quite strong partnerships with other member organisations as well, and other um, organisations in the UK and internationally. And I think we can link in and actually uh, make a fantastic contribution to scholarly practice across the disciplines, which maybe comes from our own tail background, but then can be applied to, to other areas as well. So I think that just um, extends our collaboration and, and the power that we all have and the great, the great work that is being done across all our, our institutions. There's some great question coming through. I'm enjoying the we are rebels, we should rebel. Um, but also I think there's some interesting questions around if we are being more critical in our approach, is there still a role for advocacy? And also, do we have to mention learning technology if it's just integral? Maybe we can pick up both of those points. So on the first one, I think there is a very strong case for advocacy for learning technology, absolutely. Um, I've, I feel personally critical towards advocacy for ed tech without questions asked. So I'd like us to be more discerning in what we ask of our educational technology, not be, um, not be opponents to it, indeed. We, we, that's our bread and butter. But in terms of being integral, that's a really interesting question. And one of the winners from last year's, uh, from yesterday's awards, actually analyzed strategies from higher education institutions in the UK and looked at their strategies for learning technology or if they had strategies. And he came across this problem very strongly. So if it's integral, do you still need a strategy? Do you need to mention it? So I think you should read his paper to find the answer to that question, but also, it's important to remember that being integral doesn't mean that the work is done. I think in some ways it's even more difficult when it is integral. It becomes more complicated, more complex, and 
the role of the learner and their rights and their concerns, I think, needs to be integral regardless of how explicit or implicit our use of learning technology is. Yeah, and I think it goes back to some of the things that Tracy was highlighting mm -hmm. on, on Monday about context. Yeah. And I think at different times, well, you have to think of advocacy in terms of the context in which you're going to be using technology or when someone is suggesting the use of, of technology as well. So I think context is, is key in that, and that does change. And we have to be aware of our own context, some of the in institutional context that we work in, many of the things that Amber talked about yesterday as well. So I think we have to come back to that. Context and criticality are key. Right. Should we do one yeah. more, maybe? I'm quite surprised no one wants to ask any questions, but they're all typing. Yeah, so. yeah we haven't checked Twitter yet. There's probably a lot in, 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 in the seat. I, um, I like this comment around, at some point, learning technology will just be learning. And I, I come across that all the time, and I agree entirely. But on the other hand, I also think it sidesteps a lot of people's very unconvinced approach when they're like, well, but if it's just learning, then we could just do what we did before, and we don't have to go on that whole journey. And I still meet a surprising number of people who somehow hope technology will go away, that it'll be absolutely fine not to do anything, and they can just ignore it. And wherever we are on the spectrum of adoption, there, there's a surprising number of these people, and there's a surprising number of organizations who are ill-equipped or don't have the infrastructure or the capacity. And we are here because we know that it is a big deal, because we know it's important to our professional practice. But I don't think our work is done in that respect at all, not in this country and not anywhere else in the world. And if learning technology just becomes learning, I really hope that it, it truly comes into its own, not that we forget that we've all been working for decades to establish all the ways in which it can be learning just for people to then forget that there's actually a whole journey to be made. So for the time being, I think, and also just to not talk myself out of a job, I'm going to say that I hope learning technology is going to be relevant and very needed and in the heart of what we do for a long time to come. Okay. And I think that's the, the perfect point to end this keynote. Again, can I just ask you all to thank Marin again for a wonderful <laughs> keynote. And of course, Marin will be here for the rest of the conference as well if you want to ask her any questions. But I think we can all go for a well-deserved cup of tea or coffee. Thank you.